I think the biggest loss of this space, it's not so much that, that Cumbernauld won't appreciate having theatre and there'll be another venue that will, you know, work in the same way, but there's something about this actual building, where it's situated and the people that it attracts that make, makes it quite unique. And so I think we're sort of in a, a position in society just now where we can just pop theatres up and, you know, attach them to buildings and and that'll be fine, but they lose something of that, that makes them slightly distinctive. And I think there's nothing worse than a theatre being part of a civic building. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of really nice big theatres around, and you know, in, particularly in Glasgow, that you know, I always remember the Mitchell Theatre as having really nice dressing rooms and a lovely kind of foyer and nice bar. And there was something very, very civic about it, and you had to work hard as a company to try and dispel that feeling that you're coming into something that was about a conference or listening to the provost or you know so so Cumbernauld doesn't have that feeling and I think that's what you will lose if you don't have this space and also just the distinctive quality of the space you know it, it seemed to lend itself to to any period of theatre or you know it could be very very modern or it could be quite traditional or quite period and you know I think that's um, it's more about the space and the atmosphere uh, and the people but then you know, it's very hard because obviously, I remember at the time where all the boundaries were changed and Cumbernauld then fell into North Lanarkshire and there was an awful lot of um, big meetings and about funding and we were now going to be part of the whole kind of Hamilton Motherwell um, district. And that actually proved quite a lot of problems. Uh, it was quite hard to keep fighting the corner of Cumbernauld at that time, I think, to sort of say, you know, this is important to the community. Um, and we were going through change anyway, we were going through funding changes and whatnot, but it seemed to me that that was quite a tricky time in the theatre's history. And this was after Robert, so, you know, I think certainly when Robert was here there was a very, very strong focus to the theatre. And I think the funding was slightly different at that point, so, you know, the fact there was a full-time technical crew and, you know, that strikes me as really sad the theatre doesn't have that anymore. We should, as, as pr practitioners, should be very annoyed about that and, you know, that's not right, that's, um, we've moved on that you can't actually come into a theatre and, and see the theatre space because there's nobody to turn the lights on and that, that seems to me part of the problem. And, you know, maybe things will move on and maybe there'll be a, a new, um, new theatre that will have its own identity and that's, that'll be important for the community just the same, but it'll be a shame because I think they'll definitely lose something that was quite unique. Mm -hmm. and a destination worth coming out for. I think there's something very important about Cumbernauld at that time, particularly in the early 80s, because they'd just filmed Gregory's Girl. True. And there was a really, a, a, you know, a, they felt as if there was a thriving artistic force coming out of Cumbernauld. And so I wonder if maybe that's part of, of uh, the time when the theatre was was going through that period, it was a real, you know, and also just the run up to um, 1990 in the City of Culture in Glasgow, and so there was a lot more focus on the arts and a lot more money to be had, and I think certainly there was, you know, the Cumbernauld Theatre was a professional theatre company that when you were writing your CV, you included it in your round of, you know, who you would write to, um, and that's something that I remember very clearly as being, you know, I don't even know whether or not maybe I wrote, um, sort of in 1982 or 83, maybe I wrote to see if there was any work going or any, you know, acting ASMs or whatever. You know, I think that might have been just as a round robin. Uh, but certainly it wasn't until 85, I don't think, 85, 86, that I came here um, to work professionally with the company. I think what was nice about when you were in a touring company, the chances are, you know, if, if you were a small-scale tour, which this would have come under, you know, this was definitely considered to be one of the better theatres. You know, you would either go to the Traverse, which was great, the Traverse through Edinburgh. Um, if you were in Glasgow, it wouldn't even be the Tron. I'm trying to think where it would be in Glasgow. It might have been the, um, the Third Eye Centre at that time. So the Third Eye, which is now the, um, the CCA. Um, and then if you were going to come out, it would be East Kilbride Village Theatre, maybe. But Cumbernauld was definitely kind of the one where you knew you would get an audience. Because um, I don't know whether there's still a ruling, but there was certainly a ruling that if you, if there were more people in the company than there were in the audience, you didn't have to perform. <laughs> 
but at least you knew when you came out to Cumbernauld you were going to get an audience. She had no nights off. So, um, unless the weather was atrocious, but uh, but even then, I remember coming about out here in February and things were still fine. But um, it certainly had a very strong audience, so there was a committed, a committed audience. And really and truly, that's what's important. If you, if you start to set out what your programme is as a theatre director, then I think you start to target your audience. But a very strong comedy uh, circuit as well. You know, at that time, where, um, you know, all the comedy... Uh, I feel like people like um, Bing Hitler, who's Craig Ferguson, used to come out and parrot, I remember that name. And there's also a comedian from Cumbernauld whose name escapes me and he would come out, you know, so... And also, I know for a fact that Liz Carruthers, when she directed here, was absolutely furious because she started the very first Celtic Connections. And within a year... Celtic Connections had become an actual thing at the, the Glasgow Concert Hall. So she was always furious that she said, you know, it was me that started Celtic Connections. But, you know, seeing Dougie McLean here and um, Dick Gochen, and she kind of brought a two-week Celtic Connections programme here. And, you know, I had, and, and created a, a real strong buzz within all of those artists about actually, wow, there's a, a focus um, to our folk, a festival in itself. Um, so that was something that was quite important, that it, it seemed to tap into the music side of things, the comedy side and the theatre, and also ticks all the boxes for community theatre and the, and the kids' groups and everything. So I think it was, it felt like as if it was a building that was bustling, you know, you'd be trying to find space to get your, your venue, to, you know, to come here as part of your tour, so. Um, but, you know, I played here often with Wildcat Days and various concerts and... So it's certainly been a venue that I've been to over the years. It's even as I remember bringing the kids here because the Christmas shows were always quite strong, uh, a real, a real strong presence within the whole kind of panto season was the Cumbernauld panto. So you know I think that was definitely something that my kids came to, and you know so it's a nice space to to be in as an audience member I think as well. Bill Winters was a very, very strong force within the building and even if you didn't know where he was, you'd hear him before you saw him because his keys would be clanking off the side of his backside. So um, that was how you would know him and, and was, was a really strong presence and a real grafter and had that kind of um, Pa Brun moustache. Which uh, it seemed to kind of, you know, I don't think he gathered soup in it, but certainly there was, um, it, it just made him quite. And, and even in the days of the sort of YMCA, <laughs> it kind of became, it's quite a distinctive moustache, Bill, <laughs> you know. But I knew Bill from East Kilbride, and I'm trying to think why. I think I maybe knew him when I very first, my very first, how I learned my stagecraft was um, up at Duncan Rigg in East Kilbride. A chap called um, Bill. Oh, I've just forgotten his name. Um, and I think I think Bill was there at the same time. We had a we had a connection. I couldn't think. I think it might have been because he came from East Kilbride, but certainly the keys clunking off his backside was always the thing. So that's my sort of strongest memory of Bill. That and his moustache. But a very you know a strong um, understanding of what of of you know the, the building and what it needed and how technically it could be run. A brilliant story about Robert, that everybody will probably remember this. He had an incredible ability to actually turn a pen in his hand, completely turn it around, flick it up in the air and catch it. And he could do that while he was speaking to you. So he would go, and the thing is, blah, 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 turn, 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 flick, catch. And if you were actually watching him, you're thinking, God, he never misses that. And, you know, his glasses and pushing his glasses up the middle of his nose. But um, very strong memories. <laughs> flicking up and down. <laughs> but it was it was almost circus skills involved in it. You know, he could actually. I I I thing is thing is. Then he would put his glasses up. And <laughs> Very funny. <laughs>